if you go to many conferences, you'll often hear that the first address after lunch is the nightmare gig. <laughs> because everyone's filled up on cake and coffee and tea and, and sandwiches and, and they're just settling in for a postprandial nap. <laughs> Happily, our first speaker after lunch is full of energy because that's what he's going to be speaking to us about. <laughs> now, no matter what you're doing in your personal life, in Australia, because we have such a po small population for such a vast space of, of land mass. It's a, it's a fact of life that we're always going to require a lot of energy just to move things around, just to move ourselves around. Clearly, we're probably going to have to do things a bit differently because some of our practices at the moment aren't sustainable. But how are we going to do things differently? Ian Dunlop is going to talk to us now about energy and the future. Thanks, Sarah. Well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I should just preface any presentation with the fact this is not on hashtag. I haven't got there yet. <laughs> Um, but what I hope to do is to um, pick up on a number of the points that have been made this morning and draw some conclusions on that which are probably not quite the ones you've heard today so far. Um, so what this is really all about is the fundamentals of uh, energy, climate and the sustainability, what I call the sustainability emergency we face. And this is really driven by two, um, one simple equation, which is population times consumption, both growing exponentially, and the implications of that, which people have been studying for, if this is working. Are we functioning? OK, there we are. And what this is really doing is that um, it's taken us to the point where we need today about one and a half planets to survive on average, given the global population as it's currently constituted. If we all lived at um, US levels, we need about five planets. If we, if we lived at uh, European levels, about three. And Australia sits in the middle here, about four. In fact, this week, we passed the point at which we've used up the biophysical capacity of the world that is available this year. So from now on, we're borrowing from future generations. Now, I mean, obviously, you can't keep continuing to do this uh, without getting into trouble. Um, this is not new. I mean, it's been expected um, for many years, many decades, in fact. What is new is we're now hitting the limits that people have forecast we would, and would, would get to uh, many years ago. And you can see this basically, whoops, sorry. Um, you can see this in the fact that what we have a con is a convergence of a number of critical issues. The first is peak oil, the peaking of global oil supply, which is not that we're running out of oil, it's just that we can't keep producing to make, keep, keep up with demand. The second is climate change, you've heard a lot about water and food security. All of those are basically biophysical issues. But then you have the outcome of that, which is financial and social instability. And I would argue that uh, the financial and social pressures we're now under all stem from the biophysical pressures, the biophysical limits that we're now facing. Now, that's basically, uh, I think, evidence of an unsustainable world. And what it means is we're going through a global discontinuity from the 20th century and basically the growth path we've followed, particularly since World War II. And we're in the midst of that discontinuity right now. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about um, uh, the economic problems. Uh, obviously, the GFC in 2008, um, the second stage of that, if you like, what's happening in Greece and the rest of it. 
Um, but this is all fundamentally driven by biophysical, uh, sorry, biophysical concerns. I'll talk about climate and then energy very quickly in the 18 minutes I've got. Um, this is a very quick uh, picture of global temperature over the last 65 million years. And you can see we had this big temperature jump here 55 million years ago of the Paleoeocene thermal maximum. Temperatures then dropped. The Earth cooled uh, about 37 million, million years ago. The Antarctic started to ice over. And we continued the cooling. And then about 4.7 million years ago, the Arctic iced over. Cooling continued. And then we've had this fluctuating period over the last half million years. And then the Holocene, this little 10,000 years out here, where we, humanity as we currently know it, has basically evolved in a period of relatively stable climate, about 15 degrees C, <coughs> plus or minus, uh, a little bit. And what we now see is the peak Holocene temperature is this green arrow. The global temperatures average now are about 0.6 degrees C above that. Um, the orange arrow, we're probably committed by virtue of what we've already done in terms of um, carbon emissions to about a 2 degrees C temperature increase, irrespective of any action we now take. And if you follow the policies the world is now committed to, we'll probably end up with a plus 4 degrees C temperature increase. Now, the 2 degrees C is this red line. And the four degrees C is this purple line. And this takes you back when the full effects of that work through, which will not necessarily happen straight away, obviously, but when they do work through, to the pre-Arctic glaciation stage. And four degrees C takes you back to pre-Antarctic glaciation. And you need to think about the implications of that. The 2 degrees C level means that the melting of the Greenland ice sheet would probably bring us a 6 to 7 metre uh, sea level increase. This is not the sea ice, this is the ice sheet over Greenland. If you look at current policies, then the effect of that ultimately would be about a 70 metre sea level increase. So under 2 degrees C, you'd see major changes to cities like London, New York, Shanghai, so on. 70 metres, well, you can think about what might happen in Sydney Harbour, for example, were that to occur. Now, people say, oh, yes, but, you know, that's not happening, what have you. The point is that this is what we're committing to today. So we really need to be very clear uh, what action we're prepared to take to stop this sort of thing happening, because if we leave it for another five or ten years, you can't do much about it. Oops. Okay, so that's the future. What's actually happening now? Well, global warming is, in fact, continuing. Many deniers would say, well, you know, since 98, we've actually cooled off. Not true. The oceans are where most of the heat goes, and that's been continuing to increase, as you see here. And what's the effect of that? Well, if you look at the Arctic right now, the sea ice in the Arctic, which is the floating ice, so this doesn't increase sea level that much when it melts, a little bit. Um, basically is following these sort of paths. These are figures from 79 to 2010 by month. So this is the warmest month, September. This is the coldest month. And if you plot those in terms of the continuation of those trends, what it says is that by 2015, there will be no Arctic sea ice in summer. And by 2030, 2015 here, and 2030, there'll be none in winter. Um, now, that's happening much faster than anybody predicted before. And in fact, the latest information indicates that uh, it's accelerating even beyond that path. If you look at the Greenland ice sheet, and this is information uh, very, very recent from last week, um, the rate of melt in the Greenland ice sheet, which I think um, Tim mentioned maybe this morning, uh, is now much higher than we've ever seen it before. And this is the six or seven metre source in due course. So big things are happening much faster than we thought. People say, yeah, but you can't be sure. The science is not certain, etc., etc." Well, basically, uncertainty is really no excuse for an action, as you can see here are the things that have happened. And uh, essentially, you can't put any of this down to global warming exclusively. 
But if you ask the question, well, yes, but without it, would it have happened? The answer is almost certainly no. So <clears throat> the evidence is now becoming clearer scientifically that you can link these things. We really have to move to do something about it. People say, well, you know, we can adapt. But what does adaptation mean? Well, a four degrees C world is basically, I won't go through this in detail, but it, what it means is you have a world in which we have basically a billion people, not seven and not the nine that we were forecast by 2050. So we have a choice to make. Are we going to sit and look at this and do something about it, uh, or do, well, not do anything about it, or actually take action in line with the urgency of the challenge we actually face? <laughs> if you look at energy, um, the effect of that population time consumption is we are now pretty well used up the cheap oil that the world has. Um, this is the blue line, blue area here. Um, you can see it's been more or less flat since 20, uh, 2005. And even with massive investment, it's not increasing. We are seeing increases in natural gas liquids and unconventional oil, but what's happening is the, the existing oil fields are now declining very quickly. We have to fill this gap, and that's not going to happen here. You've got to find it some other way, so we need about four Saudi Arabias to make that happen. And that's pretty difficult, given the fact we've used up all the cheap oil thus far. What we're facing is uh, what people call the net energy cliff, that all these new sources of energy coming in, the amount of energy you have to put in to get energy out, the ratio is actually declining. It used to be 100 to 1 in the Middle East for oil. Um, it, uh, and you can see the red area here is the amount you put in. This is the blue, the amount you get out as the, the ratio changes, drops here. So this is the old oil and gas, the cheap stuff. This is getting more expensive. This is wind. These are tar sands and so on. And so uh, this has absolutely fundament, fundamental implications that people haven't really thought through, which is that economic growth as we've known it can't continue if you can't get the amount of energy out in the way you used to do it. So we have to rethink the equation. And the other problem with putting this together is that climate and energy basically uh, have to come together. And if you look at the total amount of oil and gas and coal we've got, we can only afford now to uh, basically burn about um, 30 to 40 percent of the proven reserves in the world at this point in time. So why then are we continuing to explore for more? So we have plenty of alternatives to fossil fuels, essentially. Um, but there's no silver bullet, a whole lot of buckshot. You have heard about components of this. And then you have this bottom one, the unknown unknowns. And if you've listened to Robin Williams' uh, science show recently, there's lots of them. But we don't know whether they're going to come through in the time. Um, but there's plenty of opportunity. And as Ross Garno said, in Australia has a better chance, probably uh, with new technologies, uh, better econ economic prospects than we had before with coal with fossil fuels. The problem we have is that the um, official view is that fos the fossil fuel economy should basically continue. If you look at the uh, energy white paper that was recently put out by the government, uh, that's basically what it says. But the trouble is the official solutions are actually not working. Carbon capture and storage, clean coal, not producing the, the goods. Go going from coal to gas worsens warming. And if we're locking in uh, new mines and stuff, then we're locking in emissions for the next 50 years. And against the background I just put up, that just doesn't seem to make very much sense. What we've got is a fundamental leadership failure where we are not being honest about the size of the problem. Um, climate, the carbon pricing is a start, but it's nowhere near enough, basically. Uh, if you look at the inconsistencies between, you know, in ex increasing coal and gas exports while essentially claiming we're reducing emissions, and the continuing fossil fuel subsidies, coal seam gas risks and so on, um, and so on through the list. I mean, business is really not committed to reducing emissions in the way we have to, I think you have to say. NGOs are not prepared to articulate what the problem really is and tending to go with government policy. So the net result is we get policy that doesn't uh, stack up. And essentially, you know, if you're not honest, you can't get to that uh, policy position anyway. And we just have a lack of systems-based thinking overall. In terms of um, the implications of that, one of the problems is a point that John, uh, Brian Walker will talk about later this afternoon is resilience. 
Because we're committing ourselves to high carbon growth, we're pushing ourselves to a position where the ultimate change we've got to make will be that much more difficult. And if we don't change from that quickly, we have a problem. Behind it all, there's a fundamental institutional failure that um, we haven't got institutions at this point which think long term. And one of the real problems uh, that is the short termism that comes from the point that Upton Sinclair made a long time ago is that it's difficult to get a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. Um, and I would argue that excessive remuneration in the corporate world and the flow on effect into politics and the bureaucracy is one of the primary barriers to addressing these issues. So if we want to avoid, if you're looking at solutions, what we've got to do, well, we have to see our emissions peak within five years, basically. We have to um, recognise that the existing political system is not going to deliver that. We need a different approach. And we have to move, I would argue, to a genuine emergency war footing approach to moving into a low carbon economy. We just don't have the time to do it differently because we've left it too long to make the change. So the framework for doing that, the first point, you've got to be honest and you have to set out what the real issues are and what the limits are. We have the solutions, but you've got to get them in the right framework to make it happen. We've got to change the context of the debate. We need to build coalitions which are going to have to come from community up. It's not going to come from the existing political system. It's just the existing system is too locked in to the here and now. Uh, and it would involve a whole range of different people, including the military, who are very concerned about these things, and all of these international organisations, all of whom are saying precisely what I've been saying, and are being completely ignored. Now, these guys are not stupid. I mean, this is some of the best expertise in the world, and yet it's not being picked up. So, in the end, I think what we're going to have to uh, look at is the removal of fossil fuel subsidies very quickly, and halting high carbon investment for export and domestic use. I mean, Ian made the point about coal this morning. Um, you have to be careful how you adjust that um, in doing it so you don't cause total social disruption, but we do have to move in that direction very fast. And I think a lot of things are going to have to be set outside conventional politics, both nationally and globally, in terms of some form of global governance, not global government, not the 1984 type style, uh, but a global governance framework which we haven't yet thought up. So in summary, if we want to avoid really catastrophic outcomes, um, we must acknowledge that our current way of life is, is just not sustainable. Um, the Western democratic system, I would argue, in the market economy uh, has proved to have to be really redesigned with global sustainability as the prime criteria. I mean, you have to have rules within which markets work. The trouble in the last 15 years is we've got rid of all the rules, and therefore we end up with some pretty hairy outcomes. But what we've got is an enormous opportunity, because I think this problem gives us the opportunity to break out of the fossil fuel straitjacket. But it really has to happen at emergency speed. I mean, that is the size of the problem. There's no point in sweeping it under the carpet. It's going to take enormous improvements in awareness and a community support behind doing this stuff. But it's groups like this, I think, who have the ability to start to generate that type of support and uh, see this type of change happening. It can sound a bit scary, but at the end of the day, we know what to do. It just requires us to develop the will and change the leadership structures in this country and globally to make that basically happen. And I'll just leave the final word with uh, Winston S. Churchill. Sometimes we have to do what is required. Thank you very much.